Sadie Guinness, and I'm here to tell you what the f just happened in The Haunting of Hill House. Mike Flanagan's hit Netflix series is an adaptation of Shirley Jackson's novel of the same name, but it has a completely different plot and cast of characters and is told across two timelines. The show follows the Crane family, who move into the super creepy Hill House and become subjected to the whims of the house and all of the ghosts who live there. Driven mad by the house, the mother, Olivia, attempts to kill her two youngest children, Nell and Luke, but is prevented from doing so by her husband, Hugh. Years later, Nell finds herself drawn back to Hill House where she dies. Her family is initially torn whether or not it was suicide or if Nell is another victim of the house. Spoiler alert, it was not suicide. It's time to wake up, sweetheart. <laughs> Although it's a haunted house show, it's really a story about grief and trauma, and the five Crane siblings actually represent the five stages of grief. The eldest, Stephen, is obviously denial with him refusing to believe in the supernatural despite all of the mounting evidence. Shirley is anger with all of her self-righteous grudges. Theo is bargaining as she tries to negotiate with her pain. Luke is depression as he tries to escape his feelings through heroin. Nell is acceptance with her coming to terms with her tragic fate. A lot of things about Hill House remain super mysterious, but here's everything we know about the house. Unlike in the novel, Hill House is named after the family that built it and not the hills that surrounded it. Hill House was built by the Hill family in the early 20th century. Mike Flanagan had actually written an entire history of the construction of Hill House, including details on all of the hills, but sadly, that all had to be cut for time. Fortunately, one of the show's writers allegedly has been posting stories about all of the Hill family ghosts on Reddit, which reveal a ton about all of these characters. Hazel Hill, that creepy old lady in the bedroom, was the one who was the bootlegger who had been operating out of the basement. And Poppy and William's daughter Jacqueline, who was the famous owner of that cup of stars, was drowned in cement in the house's foundation by Hazel. That's super f***ed up. Really glad that actually got cut from the show. As for that random burned ghost in the basement that went after Luke, that was apparently Hazel's son, Edward. The boy in the wheelchair is confirmed to be Poppy's son, and apparently his name's Eugene. Who knew? He's just like, that kid's just like a weenie though, you know? Yeah. Just because he's just like always lurking around like, it's just like, what do you want, you know? Hazel and Poppy were the last surviving hills and they seemingly died of natural causes, but maybe they also died from all of that hate festering between them. She's a liar. One of the questions people keep asking is whether or not Hill House was created evil or if it was just made evil by all of these crazy hills living in it. I talked to creator Mike Flanagan about this and he told me that Hill House is definitively insane. It also acts like a prism refracting elements of people's personalities. And so I think it pretty much picked up on all of that like craziness and murder and anger. Let's talk about the Red Room. This is not the heart of the house, it is the stomach and its appetite is insatiable. What makes the Red Room super, super creepy is that it turns itself into exactly what the victims desire, a tree house, a reading room, a dance studio. And so it lulls you into this false sense of security while it feeds off you and eventually kills you. We see this in Olivia trying to protect her children by killing them and also in William Hill getting his wish to finally be a super tall dude, but only after dying having buried himself like into the wall of the house. The thing is, if you die in Hill House, you're trapped there for all eternity, which some of the ghosts seem to dig and others not so much. But the most important part is that not everyone is corrupted by Hill House. As Mike Flanagan told me, just like people react to grief in different ways, people react to the house in different ways, but every single member of the Crane family is affected. No one is immune, but certain people like Liv do appear to be far more vulnerable and more appetizing to the house. And after all of this darkness, the show pulled the biggest twist of all and gave us an actual hopeful ending, which was pretty polarizing to a lot of fans. In the finale, the surviving Crane siblings find themselves trapped in the Red Room where they're faced with these manifestations of their greatest guilt, but then Nell comes in and saves them. And even though all of her siblings kind of blame themselves for her death, she gives this beautiful speech that had me just like sobbing about how that all that really matters is she loved them completely and they loved her back. The rest is confetti. I can't, I can't, Erin, I can't, it's so sweet. <laughs> but because this is Hill House, it can't have like a super rosy happy ending. And so in order for the kids to actually make it out of Hill House alive, Hugh offers to sacrifice himself to Olivia and stay there with her and Nell so that she'll let her children go. It is heartbreaking, but very sweet. 
Thanks to Hugh's sacrifice, Olivia lets her kids leave and they wind up building these beautiful, happy lives. Steve gets over his fear of having children. Shirley comes clean about her one night stand. Luke marks two years sober. And Theo takes off her gloves and actually lets herself have real human intimacy. It was beautiful. <laughs> As a big fan of the book, I was not expecting this at all because Shirley Jackson's novel has one of the most cynical endings I have read in a while. Mike Flanagan originally wrote a much darker ending that was more in line with the cynical one from the book. That scene where all of the cranes are together celebrating was gonna be revealed to actually be inside the Red Room, which would have been devastating. But then Mike Flanagan fell in love with the characters while they were making the show and decided it would have been too cruel to do that and that they had earned these like two minutes of happiness after those 10 hours of just trauma and grief that we had all endured together. I would call it a happy ending because when you go into a horror thing, a happy ending means not everyone dies. <laughs> But it is a hopeful ending and an optimistic ending. It's an ending that is filled with promise and opportunities and room to grow and heal. And I think that's what a lot of people like to imagine is possible. And so that's why I like to think of it as a happy ending. These contradictions between the tragedies and the healing are the point. The Dudleys are able to reunite with their kids in the afterlife at the cost of their Christian belief in heaven. The Crane siblings are able to come together as a family in a way they hadn't in 20 years thanks to their father's sacrifice. The house is evil, but it can also be a gift, and contradictions like this are really uncomfortable, but that's exactly what makes this ending so powerful, because that's exactly how life works. Even the biggest fans of this show, though, have so many burning questions, so I'm gonna do my best to answer the main ones here. So one of the main things people keep having questions about is how the house can haunt the Cranes when they're outside the house. At first, we think that Hugh is with the spirit of his dead wife constantly, but then it's later confirmed that that is not actually the ghost of Olivia, and it's just this manifestation that Hugh created in his own head to help himself cope with everything. If you remember early in the season, Olivia tells her kids that when they see the porch light flicker, it's time to come home. And we actually see throughout the show, lights flickering and calling the Crane siblings back to Hill House. Even though it's absolutely terrifying to have a ghost show up at your home or like at their own funeral, it really seems like Nell wasn't trying to scare her siblings, but give them messages. <laughs> that jump scare in the car in particular, yeah, scared the shit out of me, but it seemed like she was just trying to stop her sisters from fighting. All of the siblings are being haunted by different ghosts, but Shirley's being haunted by a manifestation of the guy she had that one night stand with. James Lafferty is not dead, but he's, still a ghost in this universe. Steven's line at the end of the series really sums up what ghosts are and how they sort of exist in this universe. Ghosts are guilt, ghosts are secrets, ghosts are regrets and failings. Most times a ghost is a wish. If you're still really hung up on how the house was able to haunt them, when they're outside the house. Think of the house's body metaphor, where the walls that the cranes built within themselves not only trapped their own guilts and shame and secrets, but it also trapped part of the house in there with them. So wherever they went, they carried part of Hill House with them, enabling the hauntings to follow them even when they were far away. Now let's talk about Father of the Year, Hugh. A lot of people are wondering why everyone else got a red room and he didn't. There is a theory that the house did kind of give Hugh his own ideal red room. The way the red room works is that it plays off what you most desire in order to keep you in the house. And so Hugh, who's obsessive about fixing things, was presented with this problem he couldn't solve, the water damage, because he couldn't get into the red room, the source of it. This not only kept the family in Hill House longer, but really satiated Hugh's sort of need to always be fixing things and being like the problem solver. And for anyone asking if Abigail was dead the whole time, no, she was alive. She was a happy, weird, cute, sheltered child, but she was definitely alive. The real mystery there is who the hell took her hand after she died? That's probably something that would have been revealed in the whole history of Hill House that Mike Flanagan had originally intended to include. But for now, I'm going with the theory that it's actually Mrs. Dudley's mother-in-law. We knew she worked at the house, maybe she died there too, and that would explain why she was so keen on taking an Abigail right away. Some people also wonder if all of the Cranes have supernatural abilities, but it really just seems like it runs through the women in the family. We know that Olivia 
is sensitive, as she put it, and it seems that when she had her daughter, she sort of passed slivers of that onto them. We know Theo has the touch, Shirley has the dream sleep, and Nell can see across time. These abilities and this sort of like heightened sensitivity is probably what made Nell and Olivia in particular so desirable to the house and why it latched onto them so strongly. One of the most unnerving parts of the finale was when Poppy Hill went up to Ukraine and started singing that creepy song about the Groton family and how every single member just met this horrible death. He came up close behind him and strangled him with wire. But the story behind that song may actually be creepier than the song itself. That Groton lullaby is taken straight from the book where it was taken straight from Shirley Jackson's actual life. I love Shirley Jackson, but she actually used to sing that song to her children as a lullaby, which totally creeps me out a bit. Obviously, one of the most confusing questions the show left viewers with was how the f time works, but I'm gonna let Nell herself explain that one. Our experiences fall around us. We are not alone. The Haunting Hill House would argue when you're standing on a corner in the rain and you think of someone you love, they're with you in that moment. So even if they're gone in this, in this world, that they are still with you. But obviously the biggest question on fans' minds right now is whether or not there's gonna be a season two, and it's kind of up in the air. The one thing we know for sure is that Mike Flanagan has said that the Crane story is done. So even if the show were to return, we wouldn't be seeing them again because frankly, the Cranes have been through enough. But the show could continue on as an anthology focusing on different haunted places and haunted people. Personally, I don't really want a season two. I think season one is perfect as is and we need to let things go. But I know I'm in the minority here, so let us know whether or not you want a season two in the comments.